Uh, come on in. Don't, don't be shy. Um, but we'll get rolling here, uh, just for time's sake, and people can come in and grab their seats as we're rolling. Um, so my name is Alex Stratford. I'm with the Alberta College of Social Workers. I'm very happy to be here this morning uh, for your morning plenary, dealing with Wisconsin's labor pains, uh, stopping Alberta's and North America's union busting uh, contention. So. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker today. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, Stephanie's going to speak for a little bit, and then we'll have some questions at the end. Um, so there'll be lots of time for good discussion. Uh, so I'm pleased to introduce uh, Stephanie Bloomingdale. She was elected as the first female secretary treasurer for the Wisconsin State AFL-CIO. Uh, Stephanie has more than 20 years of experience in the labor movement as an organizer, negotiator, and activist. Stephanie previously served as the director for public policy for the Wisconsin Federation of Nurses and Healthcare Professionals, where she had a key role in the strengthening of voices of both nurses and healthcare workers throughout Wisconsin. Stephanie's family is also very active in the labor movement. Uh, she's married to Doug Savage, a member of the a uh, AFT, and has two sons who are often seen at rallies and at door-to-door -door canvases. Stephanie currently serves as one of Parkland's, uh, Parkland Institute's research, research fellows, so we're pleased to welcome Stephanie this morning. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Does everybody have their coffee? How is it? It's important in this uh, cold weather, huh? <laughs> um, good morning. It's, I'm really uh, pleased to be here. I guess we got to fix the we're on TV too. Apparently here. Okay. Um, thank you, Alex, for that kind introduction. And uh, I am very happy to be here with you this morning. And it is such a pleasure to be here uh, with you today to share some thoughts and lessons learned in Wisconsin uh, as we all work together in our own ways to make life better for the working people across the globe. I would like to thank the director of the Parkland Institute, Ricardo Acuna. Thank you for the kind invitation. And Trevor Harrison, Trevor's here, um, for the kind invitation as well. Uh, this opportunity to share ideas and vision across the borders is so important for us in the labor and progressive movements. And I'm so thankful that the Parkland Institute offers this kind of opportunity to all of us. We know that the CEOs and billionaires be, meet at golf courses and private clubs across the globe in order to maximize profits and extract more from the people who wake up each day to go to work. They know full well that capital crosses borders with ease. And therefore, so must we, as labor and progressive leaders, we must join our agendas across borders. And that's why I am so happy to be with you in Alberta today. In fact, uh, and I don't know if uh, Gil McGowan is here. No, um, but you all know him. It was the Alberta Federation of Labor and Labor President Gil McGowan, that I now count on as a, a good friend, who reached out to, to me early in 2011 when we took over um, the Capitol and took on Scott Walker, Governor Scott Walker, and his attacks on public sector employees. When we shut down the Capitol and when 100,000 people took to the streets to protest his union busting. And I want to thank, thank, thank uh, President uh, Gil McGowan and Heather Smith from the Federation of Nurses who invited me to Alberta to share our Wisconsin experience with our brothers and sisters here in Alberta. So on behalf of the Wisconsin uh, State AFL-CIO, I would like to thank all of you for all of your solidarity over the years and your continued collaboration. In fact, as you know, we in Wisconsin have been in a long struggle for union rights and you have been with us since the beginning. And for that, I thank you. Um, in fact, uh, when we were in the middle of the right to work battle just this last, uh, well, this, just this last February in uh, 2015, I was on my way to the Capitol where we had thousands of people uh, in the streets protesting that anti-union measure for private sector workers when I received an email 
from uh, the, the Alberta Federation of Labor, and it was from uh, Gil McGowan, and it was a video, a statement of solidarity from the entire board of directors from the Alberta Federation of Labor, and I tell you, that was so um, terrific to see, and I'm telling you that when I shared this with the workers and the, the people of Wisconsin, they were very, very uplifted, and I wanna thank you on behalf of them and all, us all for your continued solidarity, so thank you. Brothers and sisters, fellow progressives, friends, I come to you today from a state and a nation in crisis. We stand in a moment in history in which the wealthiest few have been allowed to release a tsunami of cash to buy unprecedented influence over our political process. We've come at a time when union busting is no longer in the shadows. It is now served up raw and ungarnished at the table of the U.S. electorate. We are at a time when the distance between the haves and the have-nots is farther apart than any other time in modern history. But though the skies are thick with storm clouds, light is breaking on the horizon. We are seeing a growing response from working people to take on these challenges, to take back our democracies, through workplace and progressive organizing. We stand at a crossroads, and from what I've seen in Wisconsin and here in Canada and Alberta, and by the way, congratulations on your NDP victory this last year. <laughs> we know that with hard work, with clear vision and solidarity, we can change the course and protect the future for working people. This morning, I would like to share with you important lessons that we have learned from our fight back in Wisconsin. I would like to examine who is behind these anti-union attacks, both in the US and Canada. It will also be important to look at in depth in the workers' response to the attacks and how over time it will drive working people back to do what is necessary to achieve more fairness and security in their families and communities. I will discuss with you how in Alberta and Canada can do what Alberta and Canada can do before, to prepare before the attacks we've seen in Wisconsin come your way. And I will offer some thoughts on rebuilding our union and progressive movement. Because, brothers and sisters, rebuilding a healthy labor movement is the only way to create and maintain healthy working and middle classes. Since the founding of the United States on our shared continent, nearly two and a half centuries ago, our people have tried to balance ideas of free market enterprise and expansive individualism with policies that promote individualism and the social good, framed by the guiding notion of the public good. We sought to cast off the rigid class structures of the old world and weave a new national narrative about the boundless possibilities for everyone willing to work hard and play by the rules. That idea that a better life was, in, was within reach, that each generation would leave its children better off than they had been, had become part of our cultural DNA, the American dream. Over the last few decades, however, that dream has slipped away from more and more people. Income inequality is at record levels. At a macro level, the story can be told in terms of economic data and statistics. And the numbers are shocking. The US Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that one in seven people now receives benefits from the Supplemental Nutrition Benefits Program. That's what we call food stamps. Overall, 46 million people in the US are now living below the poverty line. That's 46 million people. In Wisconsin, it's really unbelievable because now 20% of working people, people who are actually working, are eligible for food stamps. Think about it. That means people working one, two, maybe even three jobs 
still qualify for food stamps. And that's just wrong. If people are working at a job or two or three, they should be able to make enough money not to have to live on food stamps. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the United States, the rich, and you guys know that you know the statistics, but I need to say it anyway. Meanwhile, in the United States today, the richest 3% now own twice the wealth of the lower 90% combined. So think about it. Just 3%, the top 3%, control double the wealth of the bottom 90% combined. This rising equality, this inability to get ahead, this continuous assault on working people is literally killing people. A recent study by two Princeton economists, Dr. Angus Deaton and Ann Case, revealed a startling raise in death rates between 1999 and 2014 for white Americans age 45 to 54 who had a high school degree or less. Have you heard about this study? Anybody? Okay. Since at least the 1970s, the trend for Americans and residents of other wealthy countries was towards longer and healthier lives. It was unheard of for a large demographic group to experience in increased mortality rates. That is, with the exception of Russian white men directly after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. But in every other wealthy country, mortality rates were going down. In fact, research shows that the mortality rates for this group of the same middle-aged group of people are only going up in the U are only going up in the US. Every other country, France, Germany, Canada, the UK, and Sweden are all enjoying declining mortality rates for the same group of middle-aged people. So for many well-documented reasons, African Americans and other minority groups in the US have historically experienced higher po poverty rates, higher unemployment, and higher mortality rates. And yet, mortality rates are actually falling for middle-aged African Americans and Latinos as they are for college-educated whites in the US. And yet, for less educated men and women, Deaton and Case found that the mortality rate had risen 22%. And how are they dying? From suicide, alcohol, or drug abuse. The pathology of despair. This is a culmination of an economy that is out of control, where a lethal mix of chronic joblessness, stagnant and falling wages, and a lack of hope is literally killing people. This is the hidden crisis that is comparable in impact with the total number of Americans who lost their lives due to the AIDS epidemic over the last 35 years. Dr. Deaton, who, by the way, was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize in economics for this research, commented that half a million people are dead who should not be dead. Working people are losing hope. They see a system rigged, against them, which they think they are powerless to fight. In our society, as more and more wealth is concentrated into fewer and fewer hands, this American dream is being replaced by a nightmare of hopelessness. And while this hyper-concentration of wealth is a relatively recent phenomenon, there is a long intellectual tradition which actually views this sort of dramatic inequality as simply a reflection of nature the way some believe the world was meant to work. It is a school of thought that had its origins in the social Darwinism of the late 1800s. And it found echoes in the objectivist movement of Ayn Rand in the middle 1900s. It is a doctrine of survival of the fittest, in which the interests of society are seen as tied to the interests of a powerful few. Bad things happening to working people are just considered collateral damage. 
unfortunate, but as they see it, an inevitable consequence of society perfecting itself. Juxtaposed with this notion of the alt, uh, is the alternative idea, our idea, that a healthy society is one in which the greatest number of people have the opportunity to live satisfying, productive lives that both benefit them and allow them to contribute to the common good. This, I would argue, is the fundamental dynamic of our modern labor movement. The clash between these two very different visions of society. Now, let's explore the origins of this conflict, how it has played out in the political and economic life of my state in Wisconsin and beyond, and how, as progressive leaders, we must respond. We can go back over 100 years to an early promoter of this me-first school of thought. English philosopher Herbert Spencer was an influential advocate of the notion of social Darwinism in the late 1800s. He once wrote, society advances where its fittest members are allowed to assert their fitness with the least hindrance. The unfit should not be prevented from dying out. You can guess who were the fittest in his view and who should be allowed to die out. Let me share some of his other views, which were wildly popular amongst the most, wealth, most wealthy at the time back in the late 1800s. And you tell me if they sound at all familiar today. Herbert Spencer, who I'll refer to as Herb, believed that the government should have only two purposes. Number one, to defend the nation against foreign invasion. And number two, to protect private property from criminals. Any other government action was over legislation. Herbert opposed any government regulation of private enterprise and considered most taxation as confiscation of wealth that undermined the natural evolution of society. Herbert opposed government aid to the poor, saying that it encouraged laziness and vice. He objected to a public school system since it forced prosperous taxpayers to pay for the education of other people's children. You can guess where he stood on labor issues. He argued that government regulation on working conditions, maximum hours, and minimum wage guarantees interfered with the property rights of employers. He believed labor unions took away the freedom of individual workers to negotiate with their employers. The agenda of these elites in the 1800s, as articulated by Herbert Spencer, is essentially today's neoliberal agenda. It has been handed down through generations and is embraced by way too many political parties today. So fast forward to 1957 and the publication of Ayn Rand's influential Atlas Shrugged. You've all read it, I'm sure. It describes a dystopian United States in which to society's most prominent and successful ind industrialists abandon the nation to free themselves from aggressive regulations. Rand's so-called heroes struggle against the average workers who she labels as parasites, looters, and moochers. A few years later, ran further to refine her theories when she published her book, and I'm not making this up, The Virtues of Selfishness. In this book, she actually says that being selfish is a good thing. This runs contrary to our deeply held beliefs in the goodness of generosity and sharing. It runs contrary to everything we learned in kindergarten and runs contrary to the tenets of every major religion in the history of the world. So I would, I would imagine that Herbert Spencer would agree with her, noting that selfishness is nothing more than society's fittest members asserting their fitness. A movement grew up around Ayn Rand's writing and worldview, and to this day it continues to be a source of bitter inspiration to many people who define themselves as libertarian or conservative. In fact, a congressman from my home state, Paul Ryan, who was just elected Speaker of the House of Representatives, 
by the way, that makes him third in line to assume the presidency, often boasts of his admiration of Ayn Rand and her worldview. He actually credited Ayn Rand as the reason he got involved in public office. Can you imagine? Well, you may not know who Congressman Ryan is yet, but surely you know two other members of this greed is good crowd, Charles and David Koch. Charles and David Koch have a combined net worth of, guess, $100 billion. To give you some sense of how much money that is, the wealth of these two men is more than the gross domestic product of about two-thirds of the world's countries combined. Their Canadian holdings include over a million acres in the oil sands in Alberta. They are also very active in Wisconsin. But the Koch brothers, they're not just your typical billionaires. They have a political agenda you might recognize. In a recent interview, David Koch had this to say about his ideology. It's something I grew up with, a fundamental point of view that government was bad and imposition of government controls of, on our lives and economic fortunes was not good. As early as 1980, 80, David Koch ran for U.S. Vice President on a platform that promoted the destruction of our common good, an end to public education, an end to government medical care, and an end to our minimum wage laws. Herbert Spencer would be proud. Less than 10 years ago, the brothers, Charles and David, founded Americans for Prosperity as the political arm of their empire. Since then, the Americans for Prosperity has been at the forefront of anti-union labor activities across the United States. The Koch brothers and AFP have largely operated in the dark shadows of U.S. politics. That is, until the union battle in Wisconsin. And so one of the outcomes of our struggle in Wisconsin over public sector bargaining rights was that Charles and David Koch were exposed. Now, working people started putting two and two together and followed Scott Walker's money trail back to the Koch brothers. And while it's true that the Koch brothers pull the strings of many political puppets, Scott Walker was their favorite errand boy. Shortly after Scott Walker was elected, we got a unique insight into his relationship with the Koch brothers. Anybody here hear about that uh, fake Koch call that was made into Scott Walker? I'll tell you about it in a little bit. <clears throat> but let me set the stage for you. Uh, the, in the 2010 elections in the U.S. brought a wave of right-wing governors into state houses across the Midwest. They carried the Koch brothers and others' anti-union agenda with them. Governor Scott Walker was one of the first out of the box with a divide and conquer strategy that wanted to wipe out public sector unions altogether. And so when Governor Walker proposed his union busting Act 10 bill, the Wisconsin labor movement responded. To be sure, we knew since his election three months prior, there would be attacks on working people, and we, had, and we had been preparing for a fight. And fight we did. In an unprecedented show of solidarity, private and public sector union members stuck together to show Scott Walker that the working people of Wisconsin would stand up strongly to the right of public sector employees to have a voice in their workplace. Indeed, one of the biggest fightbacks of our generation, unions, progressives, and ordinary working people throughout our state and throughout the world came together in solidarity. We stood up. We told Scott Walker that no governor, no legislature, no politician has the right to take away our unions. And people came together to occupy the Capitol and make it clear that we deeply believe in the importance of unions. Indeed, more than 100,000 people converged on the Capitol. People also here from Alberta, from Canada, from people across the world joined us in our struggle. This is a moment that will not be forgotten in labor history. 
And my friends, it will be never forgotten by the working families on my, of my state. On my behalf, I offer you our sincerest gratitude for your solidarity. Now back to that famous phone call, okay? Now I want you, not now, but you know, after, after, you know, in the break, in the break, not during the sessions, but I want you to go back and just Google uh, Koch, Koch Brothers uh, Scott Walker prank call, okay? So has anybody heard about this call? Couple of you, okay, okay, so you can tell, you can tell the other folks here. But it was uh, really incredible. It was a phone call that came in on February 23rd of 2011, and that was after Scott Walker had dropped his so-called bomb on the public sector workers of Wisconsin. And this phone call came straight into the governor's office, and it was handed over to him. And uh, it was a guy from Buffalo, New York radio station that was impersonating uh, David Koch. And so he says to Scott Walker, Hi, Scott Walker, this is David Koch. How are you doing? <laughs> and he responds by saying, Oh, David, I'm good, and yourself. And it goes on for more than 10 minutes. I have the transcript here if, if you don't want to look it up on the, on the uh, Internet. But you can hear it uh, uh, on YouTube or wherever it is. But he describes this phone call with Governor Scott Walker in which he's saying, Hey man, good for you for going after those public sector workers. We really appreciate all that you've done for us. We really love it. He then says, hey, well, they're probably putting hobos in suits. And Walker says, yeah. And Murphy, the, 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 the fake caller, says, yeah, that's what we do sometimes. Uh, the, fake, the fake caller says, man, beautiful. You're doing a beautiful job. We got to crush those unions. And he says, he responds, uh, that absolutely, we're, gonna do, we're doing all we can to crush these unions here in Wisconsin. And the fake caller says, bring a baseball bat, that's what I'd do. <laughs> Walker says, Scott Walker says to him, now he thinks this is the real um, Koch brother, he says, I have one in my office, you'd be happy with that. I got a slugger with my name on it. And he says, beautiful. So Walker then goes on to say that this is ground zero, no doubt about it. Um, he, he goes on uh, uh, to say, uh, the fake Koch brother guy says, you're the first domino, you're the first domino, as if to say that you're the first domino in a, in a series of other states that we're going to go down and take away union rights uh, one after the other uh, in, in the U.S. And Walker responds to him and says, yep, this is our moment. And Murphy says, the fake Coke guy, he says, yeah, now what else could we do for you down there? And uh, they go on to say what, what he could do for them. And then what, I wanted to just get to this one other part that you're, you're not going to believe. The fake folk Coke brother says, now by this point there were 70,000 people in the streets in Madison, um, you know, 30,000 each day. Saturdays it would go up to 70, 100,000. So people are long, long there protesting. We are there. And the fake Coke brother says to him, well, we'll fight back any way we can. But uh, what we were thinking about the crowds was, was planting some troublemakers. And Walker responds to him, unbelievable, well, it is believable, and he says, that only, he said, yeah, we thought about that. So he actually thought about placing fake troublemakers within the crowds to cause trouble. And he says it on tape. The problem is, he says, that my gut reaction is now, I've talked to people about doing that, but the public is really not fond of this. <laughs> So I'm not kidding you here. I'm telling you, this is happening. So he goes on and on, and uh, the fake bro Coke brother says, uh, um, uh, let's see, uh, Walker responds, he says, uh, Murphy, uh, the Coke brother says, well, good, get, good catching up with you. And Walker says, well, yeah, thanks. This is exciting time. He said, we talked about what we were going to do, how we were going to do it, and we kind of already built the plans up but it was the last great hurrah before we dropped the bomb. So he refers to putting the act out to crush public sector unions in Wisconsin as dropping the bomb. And I stood up and I pulled out a picture of Robert, Ro Ronald Reagan. This is a discussion of what he was doing with his cabinet. 
He pulled out a picture of Ronald Reagan, and I said, you know, this may seem as a little melodramatic, but 30 years ago, Ronald Reagan, whose 100th birthday we just celebrated the day before, had one of the most defining moments of his political career when he fired the air traffic controllers. And I said, this is Scott Walker talking, I said, to me, that was the most important for labor relations in the federal budget, and that's why, uh, it, that was the first crack in the Berlin Wall and the fall of communism, because from that point forward, the Soviets and the communists knew that Ronald Reagan wasn't a pushover. And I said, this may not have, have had broad world uh, implications, but in Wisconsin history, this is our moment. So this is the conversation that Governor Scott Walker, a governor, an elected governor, uh, has with, uh, the, with David Koch, a fake David Koch, and goes on for more than 10 minutes describing what he planned to do with public sector uh, workers, what he planned to do with working people in Wisconsin, and how integral the Koch brothers and their money was to him and his agenda. Shame. It is. It's shameful. It's absolutely shameful. So even though it was a hoax, it laid bare because, you know, I mean, within, within an hour after he made this call, it was up online, it was shared all over the place uh, for everyone to see. I mean, it was, it, it, you know, it, what an embarrassment for him, but it was uh, a great, great thing that those uh, guys in Buffalo, New York did. <laughs> well, um, so it really laid bare who was behind the shameless attack on public sector workers. And despite our, our historic efforts, the political and financial war, war wins were not on our side, and the Wisconsin public workers did lose their uh, union rights in Act 10. But in the days and months that followed, the conversation that we started on those cold winter days in the Capitol began to spread. A discussion about inequality moved from rarefied academic circles to kitchen tables and corner bars. Wisconsin's workers had a new awakening about the forces shaping our economy and their lives. They pulled back the curtain. We pulled back the curtain and revealed people like the Koch brothers who were pulling the strings in Wisconsin around the country and beyond. Governor Scott Walker's attacks on public sector workers would be just the first attack on workers across the U.S. Attacks on workers followed in state capitals across the U.S., in Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Missouri. And the attacks would soon spread from public sector workers to the private sector. In fact, that was the plan all along. Now you think I'm talking all the time about uh, YouTube videos, but uh, one more one more example. Um, have any of you seen? Um, there, there's a clip of Scott Walker talking to one of his billionaire donors, Diane Hendricks, where he has his famous phrase about divide and conquer. Has anybody seen this one? Okay, well then I'll tell you about it. And again, later on when you have a minute, you can you can search up uh, Diane Hendricks and Scott Walker and divide and conquer, and you'll have it right there. So there was a film, filming of a documentary about the closing of a uh, Wisconsin auto plant, uh, and the film is called As Goes Janesville. And while the documentary director, who I know, is, uh, was doing the filming for the production of that film, he caught Scott Walker, Governor Scott Walker, and Diane Hendricks. Diane Hendricks is a billionaire uh, uh, in Wisconsin. And she's from, um, she's from Janesville, which is the uh, southern part of Wisconsin. And uh, he caught, the, this, this film producer, this, this documentary maker, caught the two of them on tape at a meeting, outside of a meeting, um, before his election in 2010, okay? So this is before his election. And remember, during his election, he not once talked about busting unions or coming after public sector. Not once in his election. It was only after he was elected. So I'm going to describe that, uh, that famous, that famous uh, clip. So they come out, and they are standing in the hallway, and Diane Hendricks, you know, she's a billionaire. And she's standing, and she's talking to Scott Walker, and she says to him, Oh, Scott Walker, what are we going to do about these unions? 
When are we going to be able to make Wisconsin red again, Republican again? When are we going to be able to make Wisconsin red again and take care of these unions once and for all? When are we going to be able to do that, Scott Walker? And he says, well, Diane, <laughs> you don't need to worry because first what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to come after the public sector. We're going to come after the public sector first, and then we're going to come after the private sector with right to work. And we're going to use divide and conquer. That's what we're going to do to take down the private sector. And Diane Hendricks responds, oh, that's great, Scott. Thank you so much. We really appreciate all the work that you're doing. So right there and then, he says that he wanted to use this really horrible term, this horrible idea of who we are as people, who we are as you know, people that come together that are supposed to be looking out for each other as divide and conquer. And he said straight up to this billionaire donor that they were going to come after the public sector first and then use divide and conquer to be able to come after the private sector. And he did that in a private, a private discussion that, uh, thankfully, to, to that uh, documentary maker, we caught on tape. So that just is for anybody, well, anybody uh, that doesn't really believe this stuff actually happens, because it does. Um, but in the years that followed, Scott Walker and his allies in the legislature steamed through a policy wish list of the far right, often using legally questionable tactics, right to work, unprecedented cuts to education and other social prog programs, voter suppression, a record that would make Herbert Spencer blush. And so it was no surprise when Scott Walker began to be mentioned by the right-wing media as a presidential candidate. You heard about that, right? As a Republican fundraiser, at a Republican fundraiser in New York in just April of this year, before Scott Walker had even officially entered the race, David Koch signaled that Scott Walker could count on his support. And for politicians like Scott Walker, Koch's support is no small thing. In fact, they plan, the Koch brothers plan to spend $889 million, that's almost $1 billion, on the presidential election alone. So in July 2015, Scott Walker officially became the candidate for President of the United States. And so, having been groomed as a national candidate by his billionaire backers, it became pretty quick that Governor Scott Walker was not ready for prime time. So even though he was leading the polls for a while there, he was actually leading the polls. But when Donald Trump announced plans to build a wall across the entire border of Mexico, <laughs> Scott Walker tried to one-up him by declaring that as president, he would look into building an even bigger wall between the U.S. and wait for it, where? And Canada. Can you believe this? He wanted to build a wall, and he actually said with all seriousness that we ought to look into building a wall also between Canada and the U.S. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't take it personally, but I was at the, the Canadian Customs yesterday, and the woman was giving me a bit of a hard time, and I wanted to say to her, listen, I have nothing to do with Scott Walker and his a crazy idea for a while. <laughs> but this is how much uh, the guy was just not ready for prime time. Um, but his, so what he, what he really, he didn't know much about, well, he doesn't know much about nothing, but he doesn't know much about foreign policy, that's for sure. And he certainly hasn't looked at a map of the U.S. Canada, uh, the border of Canada and the U.S., which is what, what, 5,000 miles long? Um, but Walker's real trump card, or so he thought, was his anti-union agenda that had made his name uh, throughout the country, the country. But to his great shock and dismay, he soon found that that message did not play well on a national stage. But sadly for him, it was the only song he could sing. When he was asked the most consequential foreign policy decision the U.S. has taken in his lifetime, 
He said that it was, I bet you can, you, can, you can guess this one. He said that it was when Ronald Reagan broke the Air Traffic Controllers Union. <laughs> and when he was asked at a CPAC conference, which is a national tea party uh, convention, why he would be ready to, to be president and why he would be able to take on ISIS, he replied by saying that if he could face down 100,000 protesters, he surely could take on ISIS. <laughs> so he actually said that. So even for his supporters, comparing peaceful protesters, mothers, fathers, babies, and grandmothers to murdering terrorists was ridiculous. And as this campaign moved along, it became clear that he was truly a one-trick pony. His poll numbers began to sink. And in a last-ditch effort, he rolled the dice at a Republican press conference in Las Vegas by doubling down on union busting nationwide. He proposed an outright ban on unions for federal employees. He proposed eliminating our National Labor Relations Board. And he, he proposed enacting right-to-work rules nationwide if he were to become president. However, what happened? Voters in his own party resoundingly rejected his anti-union busting campaign. After months and months of leading the pack, he saw his poll numbers shrink to just about zero. On September 21, exactly 70 days after announcing his candidacy, and I can't even tell you how much money he spent, but it was a lot, he withdrew. He, it seemed that his credentials as union buster in chief would not be his ticket to the White House. And for that, I can say we were very, very pleased. And so the voters told him, Scott Walker, goodbye, good riddance, and no thank you to you and your union busting agenda. So you can ask, why did Scott Walker fail? Why did he go from leading the pack to 0 .005 with no money in the bank and the, the Koch brothers behind him? I believe it's because he misread the mood of the American people. The middle class and working people are waking up. For some time now, working people have sensed that something terribly wrong has gone on in our economy. They feel threatened and insecure. And in some cases, cynical politicians and the big money people who actually created the situation were able to tap into that insecurity and misdirect workers' fear and anger. They'd say, look at that union guy. They'd say, he's got a pension. He's got health care. He earns a living wage. You don't. That's not fair. Help me take it away from him. <laughs> right? This is how they trick these people. This is how we get the phenomenon of working people voting against their own interests, like chickens voting for Colonel Sanders. <laughs> but perceptions are changing. A recent Gallup poll found that of showed approval of labor unions in the U.S. jumped over five percentage points just this last year and is at the highest level since the 2008 election. A majority of Americans now say they want union influence to continue to grow. They see, these people are seeing the results of unbridled corporate greed and ever greater income inequality. They see the damage wrought not only on their own lives, but on society as a whole. People are rejecting the notion that selfishness is a virtue and embracing the notion of the common good. And in growing numbers, they're coming to the realization that in this environment, individually, they haven't got a chance. But when we stand together and fight back, things can change.
But before we can successfully move forward, we need to take an honest look at how we got here. And somewhere along the way, our labor movement in the U.S. became complacent. Wages and benefits were good, contracts with the boss were mostly easily concluded, and we began to think that the age-old struggle for economic justice had been won. Then the world changed. Globalization made labor a commodity to be purchased anywhere in the world at the lowest possible price. Those who would enrich themselves at the expense of their own communities found this new world to their liking. The pursuit of profit became untethered to any particular place. It became untethered to any particular location, city, state, or country. Corporations lost their connections to the communities and with it, their sense of responsibility to its people. It's not that the Koch brothers hate working people. It's just that in a global economy, we as individuals don't matter. The question we must answer then is how we become relevant. How can we build a movement designed for this new economic reality? A movement that can withstand well-planned and well-funded attacks by those who think only of their own gain and have no regard for community. I would not presume to tell you the exact form this movement, movement can or should take in Alberta. That is for you to decide. But I can offer some hard-won suggestions for organized labor from my home state of Wisconsin. First, for, organizing la for organized labor, we're either moving forward or we're dying. We need to transition from a member servicing model and adopt, adopt a robust and aggressive organizing posture. Our members are our strength. History is on our side, and the next generation of union brothers and sisters are out there. We just need to give them a reason to come in. Second, we need to roll back the so-called professionalization of our unions. We need to get back to, the, to, the, to our roots as a movement for, worker, for workers and by workers. Members must participate fully and own their own unions. Third, don't get sucked down the political rabbit hole. Elections are important and elections matter but they cannot be our only focus. Of course, we want to do whatever we can to make sure candidates and our allies get elected. But the best way to do that is to grow our membership and become an electoral force to be reckoned with. And fourth and finally, we have to stop messaging to the middle. And I've got to tell you, and you may not believe me, but there are actually people within the labor movement in the U.S. who actually are reluctant to use the word union in their communications. And let me be clear, our movement exists to advance the cause of working people. Sometimes that means conflict. The other side, the, the other side isn't shy about that, and neither should we be. We in Wisconsin have learned these lessons have changed the way we think about our unions and represent our members. By reflecting on these lessons and implementing new strategies, we have seen some early fruits of our labor. I'll give you just one example. You may know John Deere farming, farming equipment, okay? We have a lot of it made in Wisconsin. And the workers there, and we just had the right to work uh, uh, law passed this year, which means that workers no longer have to pay dues or pay their fair share if they do not want to. But let me tell you that in their, uh, their contract had just come up about a month or so ago, and out of 1,200 workers who could have all opted out of the union, now each one of them could have opted out of the union if they so chose, only 11 of those 1,200 union members opted out of their union. And so we are seeing that kind of response throughout uh, uh, places in Wisconsin as their contracts are coming up. 
And I might also add that we are in the middle of a strike at the Kohler plant in Kohler, Wisconsin, and uh, we are standing fully. And right now, people are out on the streets with the mass protest and picket line. And we know that we will be standing firmly with them uh, as they as they work to get a decent contract. Uh, the main issue there is around the two-tier wage struggle, the wage issue. And if you'll remember from history, that the Kohler strike was the longest strike in the history of the U.S. So uh, this is going to be a tough battle for our brothers and sisters uh, working at the Kohler, Kohler plant. So brothers and sisters, progressive friends, our fight is far from over. Indeed, by its never, very nature, it never will be. Those who came before us understood this. Together, we stand at the fault line between two ancient and opposing views. Will we live in a society where the few are allowed to take ever more at the expense of the many? A winner-take-all contest in which no one is his brother's keeper? Or will we work to build a more just society where opportunity is a function of being willing to work hard and play by the rules? Where help given where it's needed is seen as a hand up, not a hand out? These are the stakes we play for every day. I don't have to tell you, it can often be a bruising contest. But we get up each day and do this work, not simply for ourselves or even for our families, but because the better angels of our nature will allow us to do no less. Brothers and sisters, history has placed us at a crossroads. In this, there is no border separating us. We have stood together against a dark vision of society, and together we remain. Thank you for your attention and solidarity. So we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, we've got some technical issues here. We can only have one mic on at a time. So what's going to happen is we've got some mic runners. Where did the mic runners? There, there's one. Over here is another. Uh, they're going to come, and, and I will kind of ask where the question to come from. Um, and after you're done asking your question, you have to switch your mic off right away. They're going to remind you that. Otherwise, we'll lose everything. So why don't we start right here? Okay, two things. Um, I thought of it right away with food stamps. Um, it's corporate welfare because when you have poorly paid workers and they're getting food stamps, that's corporate welfare. And we have a pioneer in Canada, David Lewis. He called some corporate welfare bums, so remember that. The other thing is, I think um, this is a question to you, but to, a challenge to all of us nationally or internationally, shareholder activism. I know some private sector unions invest in the stock market, and at least one of them in Canada is or is considering shareholder activism. But I put it as a challenge to all of us to buy certain stocks. You can buy like one of one of the dirty dozen or bad boys and girls and get active, write shareholder motions. Every annual report and website tells you how to do it. Um, if not, you can probably find a lawyer to tell you how. And get active that way. It gets them where they live. It can be really painful. Um, nuns have done it. Others have done it. The path is there. And I think it's a course of action that we all need to take. And it doesn't cost that much. It work? Oh, there you go. Brilliant. Um, thank you, for, sister, for that. And that uh, really good point about uh, she was you were making about that these food stamps that are that are going out, this public benefit that's going out to people who are actually working one, two, three jobs is actually cor corporate welfare, and that's what it is. Because some of the biggest corporations uh, in in my home state of Wisconsin, uh, you'd be surprised to know. Well, you're not surprised to know this one. Um, the largest uh, corporation that has the most 
most amount of people on what we call Badger Care, which is health care, uh, state supported health care, is not surprisingly Walmart. Thank you, whoever that was out there. Um, and number two uh, was Walgreens, which is like a CVS. I don't know if you have those here. Um, and number third was actually a healthcare conglomerate called Aurora Healthcare um, has the largest number of or the third largest number of people that are working for the hospitals that are actually needing to take uh, public assistance for their health care. So absolutely, this is corporate welfare, and this is why we are working so hard to increase the minimum wage with our Fight for 15, to increase the ability for people to have a fair share of the, the profit of the com companies. And I think this is a marvelous idea that to use individual action uh, to buy stocks and, and invest in areas that are doing the right thing. And so that's, um, you know, along with using our purchasing power to, to, to make an impact in the economy, um, uh, our pension dollars uh, should be put to work like that as well. So thank you. I'm, you obviously have the full solidarity of uh, people in here right behind you. I, I want to raise a question about the political analysis because you did spend a lot of time on, on Scott Walker and the implication was that he finally went too far and he crossed the line and there's actually a lot more support out there and he was too tough on, on workers and I'm wondering if in fact, there isn't an easier explanation and that he lost out because he wasn't crazy enough. And specifically, if you look at in that Republican contest right now, who's saying what and who's ahead, I can recall in, in 2012 when a commentator was asked about what the criteria should be for selection of the Republican presidential candidate, and he said, I think at least they should be a mammal, but these people are all reptiles. <laughs> and when you get people like Donald Trump now campaigning on um, essentially registering all Muslims in the country, and that being supported by a whole lot of other people, I wonder if Scott Walker just missed the boat on being even wilder. So I, I'm, I'm wondering uh, about a little more analysis on that, what, what's facing Americans on that Republican side right now, because I think what's going to happen down the line is in part going to depend on that sort of appeal. And the appeal is quite astonishing, isn't it, for some of the things that they're doing? Absolutely astonishing. Those things are working. Well, I'm not going to comment too much about if uh, if it's it, you know about the reptiles or the mammals or things like that. But um, I, I hear what you're saying, and and uh, and true, you said that you know was it that Scott Walker just wasn't far enough out there? And certainly, what we've seen uh, you know very recently with the top contenders uh, for the presidential race and. Uh, you know, I could go on and on about that, but, uh, you know, maybe that's for tonight's uh, social hour. Uh, but I, I did want to distinguish Scott Walker from these other uh, people who are also out to destroy our middle class. Make no, make no mistake, and, and we fully understand that and fully um, agree with that. Uh, but their target of choice was somewhat different in that Scott Walker was specifically using his brand of anti-union animus to propel his campaign. Now I am not saying, and we are not, you know, uh, sort of naive enough to think that these other uh, 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 jokers are not going to do the same thing. We understand that. But I wanted to be able to pull out this analysis based on Governor Walker's outward use of union busting as something that would propel his campaign. And so that's why I kind of limited my remarks to that. Um, but, but yes, I mean, who's the most out there and crazy and ridiculous and hurtful and uh, not only to the U.S., but to the entire world? That, that is uh, uh, still, still there, and it's a, a very serious time for us. So thank you very much. Right behind you here. Is it on? Okay. I want to say from the bottom of my heart, 
it was worth every minute to listen to you. It was worth every minute for me to get up early and be here. Because I, <laughs> I sometimes get a little bit depressed in between elections. The last one, not the previous one here. But what I wanted to tell you very quickly, and that, that will frame my question, you may not know that I was the one who watched that documentary on how you stormed the Bastille in Wisconsin. I watched it at least two or three times. And I was so inspired because I still remember that you were picnicking there, sitting there, and that building looks exactly the same as the one we have here in Alberta. And I thought, in my wildest dreams, if we could do that, but we did even better than you did. We got an NDP government. <laughs> now my question. I, I just want to mention a term that is also a book, and I think it's, it's called Harperism. And what you are explaining to us is don't fall asleep. Don't say we lost or we win, because you have to keep fighting, right? And you explained that very well, and I was very pleased that you mentioned Machiavelli, one of my guiding thoughts, because he's often misinterpreted, but you did it right. He tells you know, us we have to know our enemy, and if the enemy is too arrogant, we have to fight double. Now, my, my question is really, what kind of strategy, because you come from the United States, I admire you for surviving in that country. So that should make it easier for us to survive now in Canada. But can you give some ideas, and later I will tell you that book that I'm talking about is Harperism. And you call it, you could call it Trumpism or Scott, Scottism or whatever. Harper, Harperism is a book that was published by Gutstein, not Einstein, but Gutstein. I have read it now twice. I have it under my pillow because what it means, chapter by chapter, to analyze, and <clears throat> that is very important to understand where all this right wing stuff comes from. And Gutstein talks about the think tanks and he relates it to the Canadian situation, but you have the same thing things in, instead. I, I, I would say it's obvious that they are overlapping. And how can we cope with that kind of you know, right-wing ideology, Herbert Spencer and all these others, because it's still well in the life in my dumb street. Thank you for helping me with that. Oh, thank you for those uh, kind words, and it is really such a pleasure to be with all of you here. Um, right, this is uh, this this attack on working people has been there for a very very long time. It comes in different names, and one of the things I, I really do think is different over these past five years is the unveiling of the 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 current uh, perpetrators of this ideology who are. The Koch brothers. Now, obviously, there are many, many others, okay, but I'm just using them as the prime example because they're a good example. Um, and so I think it's very, very important that we educate people about what is going on and who is controlling our economy, that our economy doesn't just happen. There are, th there are people behind it, there are forces behind it that impact how people end up living. And those conversations are so important to take place in rooms like this, at our kitchen tables, with our kids, with our colleagues, in our churches, in all aspects of, of, of our lives, and not just in, 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 in circles. And, it's, and we shouldn't consider it to be sort of rude or, or impolitic to discuss these things in, in, in everyday situations, because the, 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 the outcome is so dire and so important if we do not. And so to become, become educated, to become aware of who is behind this, it inoculates people. Once people come out on the street and they understand what they're fighting for, once people go out on strike and are part of that, once people are part of a struggle, they never go back because it is ingrained in them forever. And that's why I talk about how important it is for us to have participatory unions and participatory movements where people are taking ownership of, of, of our future. So. So I think we're going to end it there. Um, once again, thank you so much, Stephanie, for coming and sharing your story with us, um, your experience, and, and giving us some really great insight into the movement there.
We do just have a small gift on behalf of the Parkland Institute, so thank you so much for coming. Great.